production, uh, such as Lehigh, has mercury both in the minerals that uh, they use uh, to create the cement, as well as in the fuel that they use it to create it. And here, EPA uses uh, emissions factors based on the total amount uh, produced. And then likewise, uh, refineries, um, there's mercury in crude oil, um, which can end up in, in the refinery stream, either emitted uh, through the atmosphere or through uh, wastewater sources out of the refinery. So, one of the concerns about mercury, of course, is that it's toxic in various forms. Uh, in the elemental form, mercury vapor uh, presents a hazard. Uh, sort of the notion of the Mad Hatter was in part born out of essentially mercury contamination from high ambient concentrations, essentially volatilizing in the workplace, and, and they'd be breathing this thing, this uh, vaporous mercury, day in, day out, and, and eventually suffer neurological symptoms. Another form of, methyl mer of mercury, which is of primary concern for, for human and, and environmental health, is methylmercury, um, which is an organic form of mercury, uh, which is can be synthesized either intentionally or accidentally through industrial processes and occurs as well uh, through natural ecosystem processes. Uh, one particularly drastic example um, of methylmercury poisoning was from a Dartmouth researcher doing mercury studies and she essentially used a, a concentrated uh, stock solution of methylmercury, accidentally got a drop, I think on her glove, um, and it penetrated the glove and entered her skin and entered her bloodstream. And six months later, she came down with the classic signs of mercury poisoning and eventually died from the, that poisoning. So methylmercury, you know, single drop can kill you. Um, another example of methylmercury poisoning is uh, Minamata, Japan, in case you haven't heard of it, was a uh, site of a, a large chemical company plant which discharged to the bay, and then over time, the methyl mercury concentrations in the bay built up, leading to contamination of the fish. As a result of the contamination of the fish, the people, the residents of the area who consumed the fish from the bay, eventually developed mercury poisoning with resultant uh, neurological problems, deformities, and things like that. We have to care about methyl mercury. Um, in this environment too, even without kind of uh, a large industrial source, because methylmercury is formed by bacteria under anoxic conditions in the environment. Um, and then as a result, similar to Minamata, eventually it can accumulate in the food web. Now the good thing is that methylmercury is not that persistent. Uh, eventually you can get it to degrade back to uh, elemental mercury or ionic mercury. Um, those processes can occur through biological processes, so different bacteria than the ones that create methylmercury can take it back to elemental or ionic mercury. And also uh, UV light, the sunlight can degrade methylmercury back to uh, mercury. Our nearest study site was next to the plant on, on a private property, um, just to the northeast of the plant, uh, about a half a kilometer off. Um, we have a site at Calero Reservoir, which is uh, you know maybe around uh, five, five to eight kilometers away, kind of to the southeast, and then uh, Moffett Field. And there was a wind. What would happen is that the wind would start to carry off uh, the mercury away from the plant. So in fact, what you would find was that the highest concentrations might not be exactly right by the plant, but some distance away from the plant where the plume of the pollutant spreads out far enough so that it can reach the ground and affect um, you know, the ground concentration of mercury at a point somewhat uh, more distant from the plant. And so depending on the wind speed, that can be fairly close if there's no wind to very far away if, if you have a pretty high wind speed. The maximum concentrations, as, as you can see, sort of the, the lowest concentrations at all the sites pr probably were pretty much in the same neighborhood, like one nanogram per meter cube, wandering around one to three day to day. But really where you see the biggest differences among sites is in the maximum concentration of mercury species. Um, you see a slight difference in uh, elemental mercury concentrations, and then especially pronounced differences in reactive gaseous mercury 
and in particulate mercury coming from the plant. Also meeting our expectations, the atmospheric mercury concentrations were particularly high in our sampling location near the plant in periods where uh, our location was directly downwind of the plant. Um, so we saw that especially for particulate mercury where, where we saw fallout effects uh, from the plant nearby. Any direction can be downwind on a given location, right? So, so depending on the prevailing wind, depending on the season, different communities will be affected. And in fact, day to day, depending on the wind direction, different communities will be affected. So if you imagine kind of this plume of, of, of smoke coming out from a uh, power plant or, or a cement plant, and you imagine kind of rainfall occurring all along this distance, what you would see would happen is that uh, rainfall near the plant would tend to knock out more concentrated mercury and also would tend to strip out mercury from the air, leaving less of it to get stripped out as you got further away from the plant. And so during January, which was a period uh, during which the cement plant was operational, you could see there was a pretty big difference between uh, concentrations of mercury in rain right by the plant versus pretty far away, well, three and a half kilometers away from the plant. Um, factor of five or so, five or six. Um, during February and March of that same year, uh, the plant was briefly closed down um, for maintenance. And, and there you can see that the differences in concentration were greatly decreased because the deposition on both sites were coming from other sources, ambient urban sources, and thus the deposition rates were pretty similar between the two sites. I said, okay, well, what's the worst case? Uh, the worst case would be that if you assume that deposition right near the plant was the same through an entire region all the way up to the end, and then suddenly it disappeared and, and went back to kind of ambient concentration. So f using that, kind of assuming kind of a circular area of deposition around the plant, uh, and then multiplied by the amount of deposition per week, you end up with around 38 grams falling from the plant in the area between the plant and the end. Just for perspective, um, uh, Bill kindly provided uh, the, the Lehigh estimate of emissions from 2008. Um, they did some revised uh, emissions estimates for that year, and they got around 5,000 grams per week being emitted from the plant. So you can see that pretty much less than, than 1%, even under a pretty bad case assumption, you know, of uniform deposition all the way up to the end and then suddenly drops off. Um, you end up with a very small portion falling out right near the plant. The cement plant is one of the biggest mercury sources in the region. And that's pretty clear. Um, the refinery estimates that they had in 2005, the regional water board actually asked for new data from um, the refineries. And there are suggestions that the concentration out of the refineries should be at least a factor of 10 lower than the 2005 numbers. Um, so, at, at the current rate, um, the Lehigh plant is actually probably the largest single emitter in the entire Bay region. The total amount of the deposit of mercury in the region is a pretty small proportion of the total emissions. And what happens is essentially that uh, a lot of this gets transported to the Central Valley, California, the rest of the U.S., and then eventually enters the global pool uh, for con circulation in the global pool of mercury contamination. Up until this study was done, the assumption was, as Dr. Yee had indicated early on, that mercury was dissipated uh, and really uh, they had no effect in the area that the source was in. That was the assumption. What they did was to go out in a very scientific, deliberate, planned way using the approved processes and equipment from the EPA, collecting data to test that assumption. And what they found was there is a percentage of the mercury that drops locally. That is the finding, that is the assumption. It was the first and the most rigorous piece of work that I am familiar with on that issue. And so that is really what they were trying to do. They are, are scientists, they are not medical doctors, they are not here to talk about the medical impact, the health impact, etc. Their message is the message that I've 
indicated, which is the fallout locally, and it's six times when the plant is running versus when it's not running. 